turn it over to Becky and Ku. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first panel of the unscripted series, uh, Sovereign Stages, Sovereign Bodies, Sovereign Stages. Um, we're so excited to have you with us this evening. Um, my name is Wai Jung Koo, uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I am a, a light-skinned mixed race person of um, white settler and East Asian descent. Um, I have long dark brown hair that's currently a, still a little bit wet from my shower. Um, I'm wearing it down, it's parted in the middle. Um, I have tattoos on my left shoulder um, and I'm wearing a black tank top. Um, I have facial piercings and I am sitting on a gray velvet couch and on the wall behind me is a whole bunch of art in little frames. Awesome. Hi, and I'm Becky Gold. I am a white woman with freckles and green eyes. I have um, a brown grown out pixie cut. And tonight I'm wearing a black collared zip up jumpsuit with different colored roses all over it. Um, I'm sitting in my living room in Tecoronto. And so behind me is a TV, some art on the wall, the lamp, and you can see part of my couch as well. Um, Ku and I are the co-curators of Unscripted, Cultivating Languages of Access and Storytelling. Uh, when imagining what this series could be, we imagined it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to facilitate expansive conversations about accessibility in the arts. And to us, this means conversations about how we tell stories, who they reach, and the depths to which they can be understood. We recognize that access is complicated and in a constant state of flux. It can evolve and devolve over time, shifting with our sociocultural landscape. Navigating and claiming access for oneself and one's community is in many ways a form of resistance. With this in mind, uh, we wanted to hear from artists who are intentionally cultivating methods of storytelling and performance that provide wider avenues of accessibility, uh, whether sensory-based, linguistic, or cultural, for Black, Indigenous, queer, trans, deaf, mad, blind, and disabled communities. We feel that the panelists and moderators included in this series exemplify what it means to take up space to move, work, and tell stories in ways that are accessible and meaningful to them and the communities that they are a part of. This panel series would not have been possible without the support of the series co-producers, Red Dress Productions and Theatre Posmerai, and funding from the Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, and TD Bank Group. Tonight, we are thrilled to have two interpreters, uh, Carmel Cachero and Rogue Benjamin. So they are providing ASL interpretation for tonight's event. Rogue is a non-binary human with white skin, blackish brown hair and green eyes. Their hair is pulled back in a bun and they have a gray shirt on. The background behind them is half white and half navy blue. Rogue's video is currently off. Carmel is a cisgender Filipina Canadian. She has long black hair and brown eyes. She is sitting in front of a solid black background, wearing a red sweater with a black t-shirt underneath with a light gray scarf. Uh, we would now like to introduce tonight's moderator, Merlin Simard. Merlin Simard, pronouns yel, el, she, they, is a disabled Franco-Ontarian trans feminine performer, playwright, dramaturge, and filmmaker, originally from Jojage, Montreal, and now based in Toronto, Toronto. Select theater performance credits include Transactions with Buddies in Bad Times, BC Current and NTS, Courage Vo Curious Voyage with Talk is Free Theater and DLT, Tape Escape with Outside the March, Fear of Men, a staged reading with Assembly Theater, and Sorry, I'm just reading from a Google Doc and there's an anonymous otter that is clicking around and hiding parts, um, as well as gruesome playground injuries with playground productions. Credits in TV and film include Grand Army on Netflix, 
This Life on CBC. Uh, credits in playwriting include Fear of Men uh, in development at Theatre Place Marais, Zaddy Issues, which is in development at Ergo Arts Theatre, and Tra Transactions, co-written with Gabe Mah Maharjan and in development at Big T. Merlin currently holds the position of dramaturgy intern at Theatre Place Marais. Welcome, Merlin. Thank you. Um, hi, bonjour. Uh, my name is Merlin Simar. My pronouns are she, they, yel, ou, elle. Um, and I'm the moderator for today's panel. I am a white trans feminine settler of Quebecois and Scottish ancestry who's presently sitting on the ancestral land of the Wabinaki people in what is called Southern Quebec by us settlers. I have a round face. Uh, I'm wearing green eyeshadow. Um, I have short brown hair. I'm also white. Um, I'm wearing a green shirt with a golden chain. In the back, it's a white background. There's the edge of a picture with a canyon popping from the top of the screen. Um, and I am also very happy to be here. Um, an Indigenous member of uh, my trans community told me recently that being Indigenous is sifting through the ruins of our house while a new house is being built on top. As we navigate a slew of pre-recorded land acknowledgements that passively honor the stolen land we stand on while directly profiting from that same ongoing theft, I think it's important that we look inward and understand our individual relationship with that same land. The system of white supremacy and colonization benefit from a lack of self-awareness. We need to ask ourselves as settlers, how have we embodied colonization? To confront how I uphold the violent theft of the land beyond just the room I currently am in. To acknowledge the rent that I pay to my settler landlord every first of the month. To acknowledge the water that flows through my apartment's pipe, the garbage that I make that ends up in landfill that I never saw. The place that I currently am that I call my mom's house, my parents' house, a place that was never theirs to call theirs. We need to acknowledge and dismantle from the bottom up the house that is being built on top of ruins that are still being sifted through. To understand that while our ancestors provided us with tools of destruction, we can actively give them up. We have to. Um, so now I would love to introduce our two wonderful panelists. Um, I'll start with Yolanda. So Yolanda Bonnell, she they, is a queer two-spirit Anishinaabe and Ojibwe, uh, Anishinaabe Ojibwe, and South Asian Dora nominated multidisciplinary performer, writer, and facilitator. Originally from Fort William First Nation in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Superior Robinson Treaty Territory, her arts practice is now based in Dagaranto. In 2016, Yolanda and Michif Mitsi artist Cole Alvis began Manadunes Collective, and in February 2020, Yolanda's four time Dora nominated solo show Bug was remounted at Theatre Pasmarani. Recently, she was also the Indigenous Artist recipient of the Jayu Arts for Human Rights Award for her work. Yolanda proudly bases her practice in land-based creation, drawing on energy and inspiration from the earth and her ancestors. Thank you so much for being here, Yolanda. Hello. Miigwech, Shani. Hello. Thank you. Um, oh, I, is it me now? Okay. Oh, yeah if you want to do an introduction for sure. <laughs> sure. Uh Ani Bojo Yolanda Nandishnikaski Shipa Mine Gun Nindiko Jipai Mang Makwanindo Dam for OEM First Nation in Donjaba Dagarondo Ninda. Uh hello uh, hello, welcome. My name is Yolanda Bunnell. Uh, my spirit name is Circling Wolf. Um, and as Marlon said, I am from um, Superior Robinson Treaty Territory, uh, Fort William First Nation. And um, myself and my arts practice are now based here in Dagarando. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, so next we have Aria Evans, they, she, he. Um, they are a queer Toronto-based, West Coast-born, award-winning interdisciplinary artist whose practice spans across dance, creation, performance, and film. As a public speaker, activist, and creative leader, Aria draws on their experience with Afro-Indigenous 
plus settler heritage. With a large scale vision collaboration in the departure point to the choreographic work that Arya creates under the company political movement, Arya has collaborated across dance, theater, film, and opera with a number of the city's and country's most recognized companies and organizations. Advocating for inclusion and the representation of diversity, Arya uses their artistic practice to question the way we can coexist together. Hey, Arya, thanks for being here. Well, Alan, miigwech, thank you. This is Arya speaking. And I'll just say I'm zooming in from Tagarando. I use all pronouns. I'm a 30-something mixed-race Afro-Indigenous and white settler gender non-conforming human. My father's side is Mi'kmaq and Black uh, African-Canadian and my mom's side is British. And I have medium to light brown skin, dark brown, wavyish long hair and brown eyes. My hair is down and swept to one side. I am wearing one long black beaded earring and I am in a long sleeve golden orange jumpsuit with a white undershirt. The background behind me is white, a white wall and I'm sitting on a blush pink couch and the sun is currently setting on my face and you can see the shadow of the window behind me. And this is Yolanda speaking. I just realized I didn't give a physical descriptor. <laughs> I could just do that now. Um, I am um, a fat, uh, brown skinned um, with long dark hair, which is in a braid to the side. And I am wearing um, black framed round glasses. I have a round face um, and I'm wearing heart earrings and a light blue sweatshirt that's off the shoulder. Um, and my background is a uh, tapestry of the moon tarot card with uh, pillars and words that say the moon. Uh, and that is me, Miigwech. Great, thank you so much for being here, Arya and Yolanda. I'm like very, very excited to spend the next hour and a bit with you. And it brought me a lot of joy today, uh, thinking about this happening later today. Um, some first questions that I thought we could start with is, um, what should we consider sacred when we create? Um, how do we best honor our own ceremonies? Um, and I think this is like something that's within the context of these three panels around access is really uh, important and, and difficult to do. I find that um, it took me a really long time to feel super confident in uh, advocating for my access needs and to really make space for them um, in a way that isn't rooted in shame, um, in a way that isn't rooted in excuses. Um, and I'm wondering if that connects with uh, any of you within your own practice. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I think um, what I consider sacred when, when in creation, and anytime I'm holding space um, is care. Um, I think that when we talk about access needs, um, I try to think about care as a baseline. So mm. um, care for the people that I'm inviting into the space that I might be creating with, um, or care for whoever's involved in that process or that project. Um, and then most recently figuring out that I also need to extend that same care to myself. And I think that the more that we are open and honest about our access needs in any of these types of spaces or um, just in general, I think that it gives permission for other folks to feel that, that that lessens that shame that you're talking about when we talk about making space for mental health or making space for physical needs. Um, you know, any anything that we might need to make ourselves more comfortable. I feel like the world makes us uncomfortable enough. Why can't we yeah. create in a space that is comfortable yeah. and safe? Uh, and so for me, yeah, I think when I think about the sacredness of creating, um, care is the is the thing that comes up for me the most, I think. This is Arya speaking. Uh, connected to that, I love Yolanda, what you're talking about, care and extending that back onto yourself. 
I also think about bodies as being sacred and our beings mm. and our spirits as being sacred. And if we put ourselves first, if we put ourselves before the work that we're making, that integrates into there being a sense of agency and also the care that gets reciprocated back to us through what we're making. And I also think that truth is something that I hold to be sacred. But I also think about in spaces where different people's truths might be somebody else's trigger and how to hold space for that mm. and how to incorporate care into holding many different realities to be important. And yeah, I think all of those things tie into what is sacred for me. Totally. I think sometimes self-compassion is reflected within uh, compassion towards community and to really, yeah, to just really th to hold things sacred and to also understand that our truths are so, so personal and so delicate and, and, and you know, other people's truths are also delicate and unique and, and to handle them with care too about just thinking about community in that way and and just community with ourselves and our, our own limitations and what we think is sacred. Um, and is there within your own practice, like specific elements that feel very sacred to you? Or I guess when we're talking about advocating for something, what feels like when you're starting a project is something that you feel is important to advocate for? This is Yolanda speaking. Um, I feel like it depends on how I begin that project. If, I, if, it's, if, it's, if I'm beginning the project on my own, if it's something I'm creating by myself, it's important to me that I create a space um, that grounds me and, and connects me um, to those aspects, to those creative aspects of myself. I, I find that it's harder to, I mean, obviously it's difficult to create right now, um, but uh, I, I find it's, uh, instead of focusing on the harder, I think focusing on the, what does work. And for me, what does work is creating, uh, yeah, that space with medicines, um, parts of the land around me. Um, I hold all of those aspects of my creative practice quite sacred. Um, I, I have to have, you know, books around or like um, notes <laughs> that I write myself, things of that nature. Um, but mostly it's just sort of, you know, I, when I use my medicines, it, it's my way of inviting my ancestors into my work and then inv inviting us to have a conversation, inviting them into the space. Um, I'm really intentional about that. Uh, and so that then makes the space itself sacred as well for me. Um, when I'm working with other people, I think that it's, again, it's about, for me, it's always about creating space and, mm. uh, and holding space. And so if, when I'm working with other people, um, it's giving them the autonomy to uh, create the space as well, to be a part of that creation. Uh, whatever you need, what can I do to provide that for you so that we're all um, in a spit in a mindset where we can create together or work together uh, in that sort of way. And so it I think it's combining everything that makes it sacred for other people as well and 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 um, and having that connection. That's my end of thought. And this is Arya speaking and a lot of what you said, Yolanda, integrates into how I work and cultivate and hold space as well. I think, I think the most about wanting to think about a creative process as being lateral leadership. And even inside of collaboration, there is one person who's potentially coming and guiding a process forward. But I I desire that everyone that I've invited into a space with me feels like they can contribute ideas, feels like they can ask for what they need, feels like they can redirect the project if 
it's going in a direction that maybe they're in conflict with, or they can just see another avenue that, so what's sacred for me is knowing that we all have a voice inside of the work and that the work is being made for our voices to come together. And yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I think Yolanda and I love working together is because we have similar values when it comes to how we hold space. And I think about the responsibility of that as somebody who like, chooses to bring people together and then as somebody who's also walking into a space with that ideology and the different kinds of responsibilities that it comes if you're walking into someone else's space, wanting to bring these things with you and having to engage in hard conversations to try to open people's perspective to new ways of working with you that then gets returned. So, end of thought. Uh, Yolanda speaking. Yeah, and I think that um, what's so great about the work that I think both Ari and I get to do is that we are in a unique and wonderful position as, you know, producing bodies to create that space for people. Um, often as artists, we are, you know, we are imbued to an institution and the institutions are the ones that make the decisions. And so, you know, we can, I think, I always try to say, you know, we have more power than they let us think they do, or they let us think we do. Uh, we have more power. Um, and I think that that is important, but often as artists, we get stuck in that sort of like the space that they create and we don't have autonomy over that. And so what's great is that Aria and I get to create our spaces and hold the spaces. And why wouldn't we do it in that way, in the way that we wanna see the world being built um, after we dismantle it is, <laughs> is in this sort of um, vein of care and compassion and, and making that accessibility space for anyone that we work with. Like, why wouldn't we do that? Mm. Because we can, you know? End uh, of thought. Merlin speaking. Um, I'm really curious about how, um, if at any point there was self-discovery of that process within your own practices, or it was something that was already, that was always kind of like clear to you? End of question, thought. I was speaking, I think for me, my desire to cultivate space in a way that builds agency comes from being in spaces that don't offer that. It comes mm. from feeling like I couldn't speak up, that I was holding shame around my needs, that I felt like a tool for somebody else's vision and I don't want to work that way. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be in a world that is that way. Mm. So I think the conviction and the desire that I have to change the ways that we engage with one another are, are directly related to how I choose to work and who I choose to work with and of thought. Yeah, Yolanda speaking, same, like very similar. Like I. I went to theater school. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you know, it's it's a traumatic experience in a lot of ways. And um, being sort of thrust into the industry, I saw the way in which this system worked that it wasn't accessible. Um, and that everyone just sort of accepted it, that it was like, oh, this is the way it is. So we, we must suffer. That is what an artist is, an artist suffers. And that just, uh, look, I suffered enough in my life. You know what I'm saying? Like I have been through enough and, you know, I wanted to do this my whole life and to, and to, to step into, you know, professional storytelling, whatever that means. Um, I used air quotes. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, I, it just didn't make any sense to me. And, and I sort of saw that over time that, you know, I, I tried to, I tried, I tried it. I did. I tried to fit myself into that mold. I, um, I said, you know, if they can do it, so can I, but that's like, we all have different lived experiences that, you know, I, I just, I had to confront my ableism. I had to confront my inner colonialism. I had to confront a lot of those, those things um, 
to to really see that I deserved that that same care uh, mm-hmm. or I deserved care at period while I am working um and then this and the, and I think you know, the second that I was able to create space or that Cole and I were able to create space together, we, you know, we, it just, it felt natural to create space for other people to hold other people in this way. Uh, but it, uh, it took me a while for it to come to myself. Um, and then to realize how to hold that space. It took, it definitely took some work. It took some unlearning, um, which I think is a normal part of this process and, um, and yeah, and seeing how, uh, little care there was in these institutional spaces, um, for anything that you might be going through that, that it was immediate as you you come into the space, leaving your trauma at the door, which is like not possible for many of us. So yeah, that's, it sort of came out of all those things end of thought. Yeah, Ari is speaking. I just wanted to, to tap into that. Like Yolanda, you said you went to theater school. I did my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Dance. And I think about what you're talking about inside of ableism and how to dismantle these expectations that you have for yourself. And being in the field of dance, like we are so, we have so many things to unpack when it comes to ableism that like, I think about the work that I'm doing and the things that I'm working on are just the beginning. Like I, I'm still in a work in progress stage and I will continue to be in a work in progress stage. And there is no like final destination. And I think that that's like another thing to, to just know and name and to continue to consider is this is something that we're going to be tackling forever. And again, like some of the things that we are doing might not be supporting a community and might be in conflict with another community. And yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's about investment and it's about making the world a better place. So whatever that is and however that looks and whatever that becomes, it's about choosing that you're going to put energy into making that happen. Yeah. End of thought. Merlin speaking. Um, yeah, I think like I really echo what you're saying about your experience with theater school. I think so much of colonial training institutions are are really uh, angled towards having young people embody uh, a state of normal, which is really, you know, like, uh, what do we mean when we say normal? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and to really, like, interrogate, okay, like, does it mean having, uh, standing up straight? Well, you know, like, that might not be a reality for someone. And to really understand that normal isn't this singular thing, but this really plural thing, if anything. Um, so earlier, uh, Yolanda, you touched about um, your ancestors um, role in your process of art making. And I'm really, really curious to hear you talk uh, a little bit more about that Aria too, if you feel uh, you want to share yeah. something. And uh, yeah, Yolanda speaking. Um, yeah, that um, I didn't always work that way. Well, well, hmm, I think I have always worked that way. I think I just didn't recognize it. Um, when I, I've been writing since I was like a child. Um, but when I really started to intentionally bring my ancestors into work, into work, I think that they sort of showed up in a way that I was like unprepared for. Um, when I started doing my own sort of reclamation journey, you know, um, into my indigeneity. Um, I mean, I grew up on a res, but (laughs) reservation does not equal culture. And, and, uh, it took, it took a lot of unlearning and relearning, um, to find my way home. Uh, and, and part of that was, opening my eyes and seeing who's been there with me the whole time. Um, I'm going to get emotional. Oh my God. Um, And so I went to work. uh, I went to write a play in Newfoundland uh, a few years ago that the play was about, well, it wasn't about my family, but it was a love letter to my family. Mm -hmm. It was a love letter to the indigenous women in my family. Um, And it centered around um, 
the death of a, of a, of a matriarch in the family, and it, which was based around my grandmother's passing. Well, the summer that my grandmother spent in a coma, which then led to her passing a few years later. Um, but so I was already sort of tapping into that because I was talking about women in my, my life in my life that have lived and in Newfoundland, um, my grandfather was from Newfoundland, so I had blood uh, ties to the land. Uh, but I wasn't expecting such overwhelming presence. Um, and and I guess for me, it's just, um, I, I have, when I wrote that play, I had pictures up of, of all the women in my family. And I, so I physically presenced them um, by image. Uh, and I, I um, sang for them and uh, I spent time out on the land with them. Uh, and I called them in and they showed up and we, um, it's 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 hard to talk about it without it feeling otherworldly and maybe it is and maybe that's the point uh but i i i physically feel them and they physically show up and i hear them and we work together and um and it's and it's a strong powerful um you know event to be able to communicate with our ancestors and and I think especially now especially now in the world I think they're very present and more a lot of people I've been speaking to have been also feeling the, their presence and um, I think that because we're in such a state of, of push and such a state of of renewal um, and fight uh, that they're they're really presencing themselves right now and uh, which makes it I mean more palpable to tell stories with them, I guess. And yeah, so that's that's sort of how I started working with them. And now it's just a part of when I, especially when I'm diving into new work, it's it's really important that they're there, part of that. Um, yeah, end of thought. So is Arya speaking? I'm thinking about uh, different artistic practices and as somebody who doesn't necessarily write, who doesn't, like invoke specific names or people into the stories that I'm telling in, in connection to that, just maybe from like a little bit of a different perspective. I think that I feel my ancestors when I'm in motion, when I'm dancing, mm -hmm. when I'm interacting with the land around me. I think mm -hmm. about the times that I have visited like Nova Scotia and Mi'kma'ki, like where I've, I've like had blood sacrifices be given to the land because it asked for that. And I like fell and cut my leg open or <laughs> when I've like found movements that feel ancient, there's something about like uh, the blood memory and the like the physical bone sensation of of hearing and witnessing and feeling those that are with me coming through me and I don't yeah I don't have like a tangible way to articulate it other than I think through 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 body through movement through dance I speak and bring my ancestors to life end of thought Yolanda speaking. Yeah, sorry. I just want to like, yeah, I think that that's, that's just it, right? Like they're, um, we hold them in our bodies and we hold them in our, in our voices and in our inflections and, and, and our thoughts and our hearts and our blood. Like it just, it just, I think is just a, it, I think it's just naturally intrinsically a part of creation and any, in any state because it's, it's in our, in our, body so much and that it's you know I sometimes like when I when my nails are long I look at my hands and I'm like oh those are my grandma's hands you know like like and it's it's something as simple as that can can be that sort of like connector uh between the two um and I and I have to say that like my um my friend Kim Sankla Parvi she's a Coast, Coast Salish playwright 
Uh, and uh, she said to she said to us one time in rehearsal that she's like, you're alive because your ancestor ran from a bear. And it was just like one of those things where I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. That kind of, that's probably very true. <laughs> Somebody ran from a bear one day or, you know, moved and and started a migration like it's yeah, it's uh, it's wild um, how present they are in, in ourselves. End of thought. And this is Arya speaking. I think what's interesting, like, um, as somebody who navigates, like, holding many ancestral lines in my body, I often think about, like, who who do I want to let out through, mm. and how do they interact with the other ancestors that I hold. I think a lot about, like, Yolanda, you were talking about this time and this resurrection, and thinking about my like black slave ancestors who have fought for their life over and over again in relationship to how my indigenous ancestors have done a very similar thing. And then if, if that energy to push forward is within me, how then do my like white colonial ancestors yeah. fit into that? And this ties me back to this idea of allyship and how like how are we allies to all of the parts of ourselves and how do we reconcile all of the pasts as we step into the future? And again, I think about like this good intention of cultivating space and creating opportunities, like for me, repairing some of my ancestors' atrocities is part of um, what I want to be considered sacred in the future. Mm. Um, Merlin. <laughs> Merlin speaking like yeah I, I think that definitely it's interesting too to to understand our ancestors as coming in our lives not only in the context of artistic creation but around community building and around relationship to community and understanding like when I think of all of the trans women that came before me um, really connecting with what I need right now what they needed you know 25 years, 50 years, 10,000s of years ago, and and 10,000 years in the future, um, and how that's also really a connection to community in such a, a way that is really important um, to understand that our ancestors move with us and, and follow us around. And yeah, I think that it's just really beautiful to hear you both talk about it. Um, Yolanda speaking, I, I think that it's important, yeah, that to recognize that ancestors don't always mean blood ancestors, mm -hmm. that ancestors mean community ancestors too, because those ancestors also stand with you and also show up and presence themselves because displacement is real and 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 removal is real. And, and so the connection that we have with um, our communities and our communal ancestors are equally as important as our blood ancestors. End of thought. Um, thanks for that, Yolanda. Um, I, you also mentioned something else, Yolanda, earlier um, about institutions um, and um, what, how were they, I guess, accountable uh, in making creation spaces um, that not only honor our ancestors, because sometimes I feel like it's really like like there's definitely a disconnection with the spiritual with that connection with our ancestors um in most colonial practices like i i feel like this is something that when i've spoken about my connection it's been really looked down uh upon and i'm i'm curious into like like how are they accountable in making these spaces okay honor our ancestors but also um safe and also really nurturing and catering to the sacred Yolanda speaking, how are they accountable? <laughs> I mean, I think that there are, there are institutions that are, are trying to make that space and that are, are, are giving artists, you know, the space to bring in their uh, non-negotiables and and their um, uh, their they, their spirituality and and the things that that you know we bring into to these spaces, 
Um, I, like I'll say like TPM has been really great um, in, in that regard in, in terms of like offering space and um, and having and providing that, you know, that ability. Um, uh, but, but it's tricky because I, I like, I, and I think, I think that the more people are talking about this way of working, uh, the more they're starting to listen is what I'm sort of noticing now. Um, I think there's a, a there's a, a level of fear that might be happening right now there, um, that they could lose their most interesting work because they're if they're not engaging with uh, our, our types of work. Um, and then there's also those who don't fear that at all and are, are just um, catering to their, their, their white patrons, their white audiences. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, we're, we're seeing it all kinds of levels of the way in which that engagement is happening. Um, I, I, I don't know if, I mean, I, I, my hope is that we keep pushing this forward and that more, more people feel safe enough to say, this is how I'm going to engage with work in your space. And this, mm -hmm. and this is how I need to feel supported. Um, and that more institutions are like, yes, we will do that for you. Um, but um, and I, and not every institution is gonna do that because at the, at the core of why they're running is is still capitalism, and mm. they're not putting the story first. And so, until institutions can actually put the story first, then we're not going to actually see that switch, right? We're not going to see them being held accountable for not engaging in those practices. Um, and it's not to say that they have to engage in every spiritual practice, but but give the space to artists and 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 listen to the ones that are coming in that are saying we would like to run in this way. Um, and 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 that uh, and that particularly when it comes to like indigenous ceremonies like uh, smudging and and being having medicine present having elders present or healers present that that is absolutely a non-negotiable and should never ever be denied uh, an indigenous artist. Um, I mean I think really in spiritual practices uh, cultural spiritual practices should be always allowed in spaces. Um, but I've definitely been in institutions where, you know, smudging has been like, a, like, no, 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 you have to smudge outside or we have to do, you have to go in that room over there, <laughs> down the hall and around the corner. Like it's, so yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I know the answer, but, uh, that's just what I've been noticing, um, in my rambling that I just said, I <laughs> of thought. This is Arya. I, a few things came up in what you shared, Yolanda, so I'm just going to jump off from there. And Please. I think about, like, how do we also inform artists that they can ask for things? Mm. And then how do we inform these institutions that they can make that happen inside of the structures that they might be working inside of? Like, I think a lot about how we get boxed into this idea of like, well, the system is this way and like, this is how things run. And this like, we can't break that protocol and no, it has to, we have to follow these steps. And to me, that's not about relationship building. That's not human to human. That's some um, like bureaucratic hierarchical BS that we can just get rid of because if we want to, move forward we we have to center relationships and we have to center these like personal connections and show investment in people on a like personal level that goes beyond just one interaction i think it so it's it's hard because there's so many sides to that how do we educate artists like do we how do we infiltrate the school systems that yolanda and i both went through to to let emerging artists know that she, they can ask for support, they can ask for their practices to exist in the spaces that they're entering. And then how do we also allow like institutions and organizations that are hosting artists that are asking for things that are like, should be a human right, that they do have the resources for it, that 
they do have the time mm. to make it happen that uh yeah that it that it is possible that it it really is just about like maybe one shift of your frame of mind to to make it possible to to just create more nurturing spaces and again yolanda like you talk about uh like organizations not wanting to lose their most interesting engaging work and again like artists are what bring people into spaces and like reciprocity has to exist and definitely power has to be mm -hmm. shared but but if we can again like when i talk about like the microcosm of put the artist first before the work it's also like in an institutional setting like put the artist that you're bringing into your institution before the institutional structures yeah and the platform Yolanda speaking. Yeah, totally. That's, that's it. And I think like, um, I, the, I, I yeah, that's a great, Aria, that's a, those are great questions. Like how do we ensure, how do we pass on that knowledge to artists, young artists, especially, um, and how do we, you know, ease the calm institutions down and let them know, like, it's going to be okay. You know, um, I think, uh, the only the only way that I, I mean I do a lot of like workshops and facilitations and things like that with high school students and so I I I try <laughs> I try to get in I'm like if you're gonna go to theater school please expect this is what's gonna happen and and that's not the only way you can you have to engage with art um, but I I think for me like the best way I can possibly what I've learned or what I'm trying now is just by doing by example. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when I'm engaging with an institution, I'm like, okay, so now I'm like, this is my, um, we're going to, we're not going to, I'm not going to sign the contract that you give me. What we're going to do is we're going to sit down we're going to have a conversation about what this living agreement is going to look like. Uh, and then we discuss that. And so that includes, that will now include uh, care and, um, you know, uh, baseline and care over profit, making sure that they're like, uh, are the spaces safe for people, um, d depending on how far the contract goes, if it's a production, then it's like, I'm going to negotiate that we have shorter work days, that we have shorter work weeks, that we don't have two show days, the things that are, that burn artists and designers and creative teams out need to not happen anymore. And so, um, the only way we're going to start to see that is if somebody, if we have those engagements and we start bringing those things to the table, otherwise we're never going to know if it doesn't work or works or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think leading by some kind of example is the only way that we're, that, that institutions, if they see that it works, at least with one person or two people, then maybe they can like continue to keep that up and continue these types of engagements where they're open and listening. Um, and that that and that what Arya is saying that the power is shared that there is an understanding that the institution there's always going to be that hierarchy of power. They are the one that are that is providing the platform. They are providing whatever you know whatever it is that they're giving us. Um, and, and so the idea is not, you know, we can't change that, but what we can do is change how we engage with it. That the institution does not have to wield the power that they have, that they can relinquish it and, and, and share it amongst us so that we're all holding equally those, that we're all partners in, in that work. Um, end of thought. Merlin speaking. Thank you so much, both of you, for that really, those are really thoughtful uh, analysis of institutions, but also class. Um, <laughs> I, I think this like idea of like living arrangement is really interesting because art making isn't just, um, you know, hours in a studio. It's, you know, it's emotional work. It's, it's sometimes staying really late and sometimes eating in these institutions and really understanding that the ecosystem isn't of an arts institution specifically isn't just limited to the art created, but everything that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. um, a, a great thing that you also said, Aria, um, was about how to put the artists first and the institution within that framework. And I think within the context of disability, it's a really interesting topic to talk about because 
really what often ends up happening is that disabled um, people are brought in at the last second specifically for plays and they're like, hey, here's a relaxed performance, like how can you do this? You know, meanwhile, the script has already been built with several like violent light flashes, um, there's loud noises. Um, and like, I think it's been really thinking about capitalism, but also thinking about money in relationship to time and how really the formatting of like creation workshop production is going to lead to this like idea that it's like within production, then we can bring on people. But really, if we conceive of time as this stretchy thing that can be like long and short, um, like is, is, you know, adaptive and it's, I think, a reflection of access too. Yolanda speaking. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that, and something I, I really want to start, I need to start implementing into my work is accessibility from creation point. Um, uh, I took a wonderful workshop with Alex Bulmer, who is a lovely blind artist, and it was called Blind Imaginings. Um, and we learned a lot about, you know, how to create work that it, that does not need audio description like how do you how can we create work that is that is just an inherently accessible um uh and part of that i i learned some of that work too from kim harvey um you know and and i brought it into i tried to bring it in with bug uh when last year with um when we invited folks into the space that, you know, they were allowed to leave their phones on, they could leave the space if they needed to, they could, and, and come back in whenever they needed to, um, that there, that there was, uh, you know, that they were given autonomy uh, over themselves. Cause this, I, I don't know where this idea came from where people have to like hold, the, like they are not allowed to leave the theater. If they leave the theater, they're not allowed back into the theater. Who came up with that? What is that? What it, can somebody explain why somebody can't go to the bathroom? Are we so precious about art that we can't, like, I don't, it, do, it makes no sense to me. Um, and it's incredibly ableist and, and uh, for so many reasons. And so accessibility is on my mind a lot. And, and I, I, I know that I need to do more work. Uh, into implementing it in from from the get from creation point, uh, and 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 being aware of of all of that when I'm creating a story that it's not um, that it needs to be for everybody because if I'm going to continue to talk about systems that harm, and because they're not for everybody then they don't work then I also need to be a part of creating something that lives within that realm that it needs to be accessible for everybody um yeah end of thought merlin speaking yeah i i think it's really like from what you're saying like it's really interesting to just think about all of these rules and and where rules become um access needs where they become safety but where also they become um quite the opposite most often right and to really i think finding that balance between um, rules that, you know, are conducive to inclusion and rules that are not conducive to inclusion. So exclusion. Um, another question that I have for the both of you is, um, how do you implement decolonial ways in your own practices and or in your uh, own accessibility consideration when creating? So really process based, um, not looking for an answer that feels like a how-to for everyone, but really personal and connected to your artistic practice in conjunction with your ancestors and of thought. Yolanda speaking. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think I've already, everything I've really talked about today is, is really kind of how I, I implement that. Um, and it's interesting because I think a lot about uh, the word decolonize now, I feel is taken on a different meaning and, and it doesn't, 
I don't necessarily know. Language changes all the time. Uh, and we're always trying to keep up with it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and yeah, I, I do think of like, when I think of decolonizing, I, I'm, I active, I think of active unlearning, mm. uh, and, and active dismantling. And so when I'm, when I'm, I feel like decolonizing has to start with me and it has to start with the work that I have to do on my brain and, and my body and my, my spirit and my, like I, all the things that make me up. Um, I have to do that work before I can uh, like 100% in all honesty, give it over to somebody else. Right. Like I can give it, um, but it also still ha it has to start with me. I wouldn't have been able to do that work if I didn't start that process already. Right. Um, of the, of the unlearning of myself and, and what's been told to me my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I think about decolonization, I actually think of it as decolonizing my own brain and the active work of unlearning these things that have been implemented um, my entire life growing up in this world that wasn't built for me uh, and, 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 and making me feel like I had to, uh, I had to find a way to fit into it rather than um, working against that and building my own world. Um, and so when I think about how I hold space, I actually think about that as indigenizing as opposed to decolonizing. Um, I think about, I bring in what feels to me like deeply indigenous practice um, into spaces and so, which inherently is decolonial because it is their, their, their old practices, you know, that we've never worked this way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, I think they're, I think they're separate things with the same sort of like, can, as a connector between the two, because I'm not going to go into a space, I'm not going to indigenize uh, an institution, right? Like I can't do that. That's not my job. And I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to decolonize the institution because again, that's not my job, right? But what I can do is offer a space that is for me uh, rooted in a deeply indigenous practice that is inherently decolonial. Um, and then the decolonizing, I think, is something that we, it's personal, I think that we have to do that work. And that institutions in themselves have to decolonize themselves. They have to do that work. I can help by showing them how, how things are, that there are alternative ways of doing things. Um, but I, I, I can't do that work for somebody, right? Like that's, so that's sort of how I think, or, or you know, how I engage with that word. And it's and it's constantly changing and shifting over time because as language does and as we and as these processes do, um, the more we learn, the more we unlearn, uh, the more it shifts everything, right? And um, but yeah, that's where I think I'm at with it right now. End of thought. Aria speaking. The things that I think the most about when the word decolonizing or the idea of re-indigenizing comes up is how we spend our time and what we place value on. Like I really think about unlearning the pressures that we put on creative process and being product driven and feeling like we have to like produce and produce at a really fast pace that mm. is all about giving something to be consumed and I think about like different approaches to time even inside of a rehearsal process like Yolanda I know does this in their rehearsals as well where you check in and you check out and that's time that gets taken away from the work but it's not actually taking away from the work it's adding to the work and just like shifting our perspective on what we place as being like valuable and not valuable. So time is one thing. And then also I think value, which we've talked a lot about, like valuing the people that are in the room, valuing what you're hearing them say that they need, valuing the fact that we don't need to burn out, that mm. we can actually like care for ourselves. And that as a result makes our work deeper, makes our work 
like thrive in a way that like I think about if we can make work from the values that we believe in like how beautiful of an offer could that be so if we can place that into the way that we're working in rooms that that feels like decolonizing and that feels like the change that I want to be a part of mm. end of thought um Merlin speaking yeah I think when we're really thinking about unlearning like I think like the way that I frame it within my own practice is thinking about imagination and feeling like unlearning requires that imagination. It requires thinking of something else besides what is colonially prescribed, you know, and to really, and, and, and I feel like imagination can be used to like really, how can we create a process that serves like your practice? And is it like a one size fits all for, you know, everyone, like across the arts like that's not how it should work or or how it fits around disability right it's like yeah like even when thinking of access needs like they're gonna change and they're gonna mean something different to someone else like like I, I think I think part of of unlearning is also unlearning that everything is the same and that there's really this like, and to really get out of the binary, you know, but to fall into this like beautiful gradient of colors where things like shift and, and things also evolve outside of the gradient um, and to really think about things like that too. Um, one more question. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to, so this question is really interesting to me, not that the other ones weren't, but, um, <laughs> around um around body sovereignty and around specifically and i think that really kind of endemic to to both my experience with transness and my experience with disability um is that it took a long time for me to understand that i was the best um uh, person to know what was best for my body um and to me that really fell fell into this like this area of body sovereignty and um, as artists who have ties to indigeneity, I'm curious to hear how you feel that body sovereignty and land sovereignty intersect. Where do they meet? End of thought. And I know it's a big one, so you can think about that one for as long as you end of thought. Again. Yolanda speaking. Okay, so I this is something that's like this is really big in my work right now. Is I'm really trying to get people to shift our collective thinking about how we relate to the land and how our bodies relate to land. Um, we come from the land. And so I, I, I think that there's, I mean, the, no, I don't think there has been a physical extraction of us from, from land and now, and we've put ourselves as humans in this hierarchy, right? Like we see ourselves as the top of the food chain. Um, whereas like, when I think about how we've, you know, for, at least for Anishinaabe people traditionally thinking about it in a circle and a cycle and that we were a part of the land. And so that it's, it, you know, whatever we take from, we move, we keep moving so that we don't take more than we need. Like there's always been this like, there was always this sort of work in tandem with the land because we understood that we were a part of it, um, that, that we're no different from it, that it's the same breathing. I breathe like the plants breathe. I, I have water like the water, like we all share those things with the land. Mm -hmm. And so, and we can see, like, it's not even, it's not even, I, and I, what, what drives me insane is when people, um, when people, call this or sort of see this sort of idea as being mythical or spiritual or like something other than physical um when it's it's actually physical it's tangible we can see it right like we are a part of the land and we and there's a direct link to land extraction and to our missing and murdered indigenous women and girls to spirit folks like there is a direct link to that we can see the there is a um a map that was released that was it there was one on the above that showed the pipeline route and then right below it they showed the sex trafficking route and it's the same route 
So like land extraction, body extraction, the same thing. Um, and it's not, it's physical, it's tangible, it's real, it's right there in front of us, we can see it, right? Um, and so I think that the more that we need to, the more that we remember that we are a part of the earth, that we are a part of the land, the more we can start to repair that sort of relationship. The land is sick and we are sick. The, we're, the, the, they're the same, right? As long as the land is sick, so are we. Um, and, 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 and I think that the more that we start to remember that and the more we start to reclaim that work and really come back, back to the land and return to it, that, those, that healing can start happening or that, that, that healing can move forward because the more we keep ourselves removed from it, the, the more sickness is gonna happen, I think. And, 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 that, and sickness means so many things, right? It can mean all kinds of things. And um, yeah, so that's how I feel <laughs> the connection between those two. And like, I think when we, yeah, when we, I think that, you know, as colonized people, there's been a feeling that, that it, like, because of that extraction and that extinguishment that happened, like, that feeling of, of our bodies not belonging to ourselves, you know, uh, and under the Indian Act, we're still the Queen's Indians, you know, like we still belong to Canada. Um, our bodies are not sovereign because we are not sovereign people and neither is the land. And so that's how those two are this, that's another way those two intersect, right? Like until we are granted land sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty, those things are not going to, we're not going to be free from that. So um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of like land back. <laughs> yeah, end of thought. <laughs> Aria speaking, I'm like, do I even need to say anything? That is like, <laughs> I feel all the same ways. Uh, I think something that I can add is a proposal of a way of looking at it as a metaphor. Like, if you think about your relationship to the land, like, and you think about your relationship to yourself, where do those two things intersect? Like, if you love yourself, do you love the land in the same way? If you say that you love the land, how in return are you loving yourself? Like what Yolanda is saying about like our bodies are born from the land. We we are made of the stardust. We have eaten the food that has fed us. We are drinking the water that makes up most of our body mass. We breathe the oxygen that exists in the trees that potentially we've planted that the relationship between body and land is forever intertwined. And the idea of like the different indigenous worldviews of like humans, we place ourselves at the top, but the land doesn't necessarily need us to survive. Like we contribute to the land. We are a part of its evolution. And right now we're not doing a very good job of taking care of it. But I mean, like historically, the role of the human does integrate into caring for the land and like allowing for species to continue and like plants to grow but yeah i just i think about the the disconnected link between like if we loved the land the way that we loved ourselves would it look the way that it looks right now or I mean, it's also sometimes like self-love can be hard. So it's like, if you looked at the land like a lover and you consider how you're treating that lover, would you want somebody to treat you in that way? I think I'll take it back to a metaphor and then also um, drop the land back. <laughs> my... um, and Marlon speaking. Um, yeah, I think like, especially the idea of, of a lover like brings in ideas of consent too, right? Of, of when is no, what is no, what is yes, when is yes. Um, but also to understand consent as this, you know, not as this fixed thing, but as this thing that really is slow and like takes it time and it's, 
is infinite. Consent is infinite. Um, as my last question before we fall into a Q&A period, I'm wondering as we're talking about like land, because uh, because of the pandemic, like so much of our work is connected to technology. Um, and I'm assuming that some of your work in the last year has involved on been involved on a platform just like this. And I'm, I'm wondering how you um, maintain your connection to land within um, something that, well, technology is connected to land in some ways, but yeah. it, in many ways it isn't. Uh, Yolanda speaking. Stop. Oh, there he is. Um, yeah, I mean, our la I mean, our laptop. A lot of the technology that we have is from land extraction, um, and at the expense of um, labor that is um, probably not great. Uh, and uh, and so I think the more, especially this last year, I mean, we've been really reliant on on these technologies. And so, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that. Uh, I've heard some acknowledgments been given about that um, in some in some places, but in some virtual spaces I've been in, um, which I think is great because I I don't think people think about that uh, mm -hmm. about where our devices come from and and the the uses that we have and our dependability on on land extraction and oil and and you know these addictions that we have um, in the society. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky thing to navigate, I think, because we wouldn't be able to have these connections if it weren't for those things. And so how do we hold those truths at the same time, right? Uh, it's it's always a it's always a hard one. Um, and yeah, I mean like <laughs> I've had to do workshops online for some of my work and my work is so land-based. So it's, it is, it's been tricky to, to feel that connection. But I, I, one of the first things I said, um, when, when this, uh, pantomime first hit, uh, was, <laughs> that, um, you know, the, that we have to remember that the land is still underneath us. Like as much as we get stuck in our, you know, when we're stuck inside of our homes and and having to communicate this way that um to remember that we are only being we are being literally held up by the land and underneath our floorboards and our our tiles and ceilings of people who live below us and underneath their floors that the earth is still there mm -hmm. um and that you know if you go outside and you see like a little little piece of greenery growing through concrete or a tree on your walk or any any way um, that you can feel grounded or find that connection to the earth while having to go through what we're going through um, it's uh, it's important and one of the things I saw I noticed when it when everything happened last year was was how many people started turning to the land, was how many people were like, oh, I didn't realize that I lived near this park or, oh, I didn't realize how much I needed this tree. And I'm like, she's been there for you the whole time, baby. <laughs> like she's been there for you the whole time, you know? Um, and I just, I, I, I want people to remember that, you know, and, and, and remember that the houses that we live on are on her and that she's still holding us and that she still exists underneath us right now. And if this Aria speaking, I have two thoughts. One is like, how do we imagine our bodies as landscapes? And back to this idea of like land and body sovereignty, how can we also like recognize that land is always with us because it exists inside of our body? And I also think about how much the land has healed in this time where humans have been putting energy elsewhere. And what that means and how we can learn from that and how we can change our ways moving forward and like this last year has shown us a lot but i think it's also allowed us to see the impact that we have on the environment in a way that a lot of us have always known and spoken about but we haven't collectively like experienced it or seen the sort of like vast jumps back to like cleaner air to like, ecosystems thriving again that that our human footprint like we don't 
what can we live without? What are things that are in excess that we don't actually need? And that ties back to like capitalism and <laughs> colonialism. <laughs> but yeah, those are the two things that I'm thinking about. And a lot. Um, Merlin speaking, thank you so much for that. Yeah, you're right, Yolanda. Like I, I meant to do a technology acknowledgement before um, I'm a nervous girl. I forgot about it. Um, but yeah, here it is now. Like we acknowledge that um, that technology like has an environmental like effect over uh, resource extraction, but over producing it and thinking about um, the elect the electricity that is required for uh, our conversation today, and and how yeah, and I I think land is so inconspicuous around us, especially like people who live in city. I live in a city most of the time, but that tree will always be there. Um, hey girl. Um, so now we'll be moving into the spirit of Q and A um, where literally everyone who's on the Zoom call is invited to um, share some questions. I know in the chat there has been some questions already, so we can turn to them. There's two ways that you can ask your questions. So number one in the chat. Uh, number two is so at the bottom of your Zoom screen there should be like a, a little smiley face that says reaction, and within that reaction feature you can wave your hand um, and you can ask your question from your little box. Um, so I think maybe we can start with the question that Lili asked. Um, they asked, uh, for Yolanda, how do you balance that offering of sitting down with institutions to coach them in that way and your free labor as a consultant? Uh, well, the it's you not free labor because I usually ask for a fee. <laughs> Um, the first, well, what, the one negotiation that I did, I didn't actually because I, I didn't think about it. Um, but uh, once we started negotiating, they the, the institution was straight up like, and we're going to add like $300 to your fee because you did all this labor. And I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. Uh, so <laughs> um, yeah, I, I uh, it's sometimes... Um, I mean, I don't know, sometimes it's like, I don't think of it, I don't think about it, right? Because it's just an instinct for me now. And I and I just want to like, make sure that I'm engaging in a good way. Um, and then I often think about it afterwards. And then I'm like, Oh, maybe I should have, you know, but but I mean, for this, for the now I know, and I think moving forward, I'm gonna start uh, making that a part of the conversation, because I think it is important that we as as artists who do this extra labor do get paid for it um and that's incredibly important uh that we are uh that we know what we're worth and that we are not afraid to ask for what we're worth and that our time and energy just needs to get paid for and um and that emotional labor uh is particularly if you're dealing with like trauma enforced you know work uh, that that there's a there there needs to be a cost to cover that because uh, it it takes its toll and often the artists that are speaking about these things are marginalized racialized artists and um, uh, need the funds <laughs> and so uh, and so yeah I I think that it, it's always a tricky thing to balance those things and it's hard to ask for um, it's hard to know what we're worth and hard to ask for what we're worth, but it's an important thing to put into practice um, and and to hold. And so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I just have to think about it now more and make myself aware of my own worth and making sure that I'm presencing that when I'm engaging with institutions. End of thought. Um, Merlin speaking and Arya, if you mm -hmm. feel like there's something you want to add on this even though the question said for Yolanda I <laughs> like you're so welcome to, to share uh, any insight you may have if you feel like it. yeah all right speaking I will just say one thing like I I even struggle with this where I don't know how much to ask to be paid for something mm. and I think about like 
how do we build a sense of transparency and a sense of support inside of our communities to like share the fees that we ask for when doing that kind of work because there's so much gatekeeping when it comes to talking about financial compensation. So that's something that I'm thinking about. End of thought. Mm. Yolanda speaking. Yeah, I think fee transparency is really important. Um, as we've kind of over time learned uh, the the paid like paid discrepancies amongst artists. Um, and uh, and yeah, and one of the things that like Managuits, for instance, is implementing is like is that we're you know, we're, we're trying to be open with what with everyone, what we're paying everybody across the board so that people understand, people, everybody knows, and, and, and actors are invited to production meetings, like those types of things that, that uh, somebody said in the chat, transparency, it's, it's, it is the ultimate, um, you know, we, we need it when we have these engagements, uh, because why are you hiding things? Why are we, you know, and that, and that it is important that we, we know what each other is getting paid so that you know, we feel like we're not being cheated or um, or left out of those, you know, negotiations in some way. End of thought. Merlin speaking. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the transparency idea and, and around trust too, right? So how, like, I think it's different from an organization to an artist, but it's like, because artists have really been like messed over by organization and are still being messed over right now, especially in this pandemic, like to be like, where is, where is, where is transparency end and trust begin? And, and yeah, and I, I was just thinking too around like ideas of like, when is it, like, I'm, I'm really kind of curious about now about your process of trust when working with a company and, and and this is a really vague question, <laughs> but um, like, how do you trust? How how do you create that trusting relationship where where mistakes can happen, but also listening can happen more than talking? End of thought. Yeah, Arya speaking. For me, trust gets built in many ways. I think one is showing humility and showing vulnerability, like admitting if you don't know something, uh, saying like recognizing if you've made a mistake. And if you like, if you are in an artistic leadership position, how do you model that same behavior so that other people feel like they can give back in that same way. And I think back to this idea of like time and value and to, to again, cultivate opportunities for these conversations to happen that we we are giving time and we are putting value on people's needs that trust gets built i think also um like i think about this a lot when when we like see ourselves represented in the places that we're working that like trust also gets built by organizations showing you that you're not the only person of a certain community or experience or identity that they're bringing mm. to work with them yeah. and like where and where we see representation inside of like organizational structure is like another way to build trust um yeah Yolanda I know you were like about to speak so I will I will jump off of what what you were gonna say if you want to speak in the thought Oh no, uh, we go, <laughs> yeah, you want to speaking. Um, no, I think I think you representation is really important. I think that community engagement is also another aspect of it. We uh, there are institutions that have I, I literally have zero trust in at all. Like I'm like I don't like you've never been interested in in these stories and in the stories that you've put on stage have been harmful. So like. Mm -hmm you've got a lot of work to do. And then there are other institutions that are like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna what, what do we do? What do we help, 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 help? You know, and so there's, um, and that also takes that, that like the ones that are sort of stepping into it and being like, okay, like now we're, what do we do? That's gonna take some time, right? That's gonna take some building of trust. And so I think listening, I think, I think community engagement and not making it tokenism 
that it's it's genuine engagement with community um because otherwise because if you have if as an institution if you have never had a relationship with a specific community then how are you expecting that community to show up in your in your in your place and watch your stories like you can't you can't only invite people over once in a while you know what i mean like you have to have you have to have a relationship with that community otherwise it's it's false and it's it feels disin, disingenuous um so i think i think relationship building community building is is a really important part of that i also think just the understanding on both parties on all parties involved that harm will happen um it's not usually a matter of if it's usually a matter of when it's going to happen and it's a matter of how that harm gets handled um and like how are we discussing it and so when i was in negotiation with this you know these agreements that was a part of it is like when harm happens or if harm ha if and when harm happens this is how we're going to this is how we're going to handle it um and and i think an acknowledgement of that is important because if we need to understand that like not everybody has that, all the answers and that we're all trying to figure it out together um but but yeah but listening to artists is important um and that there's that that there that the the chances of something happening that harm happening with an institution is is high and so we just it's a matter of how it's dealt with and how it's dealt with is is incredibly important to how the structure of trust gets built mm -hmm. um and if we see that being dealt with in a way that is causing further harm uh then that trust gets broken whereas if we're you know adhering to this agreement that we had or these oral agreements that we have or these discussions that we're having um that that is an important aspect of it as well um but acknowledging that it's going to happen is is a is i think a big part of it because we're trying to build something new right and and within that it's there's always going to be questions and and uncertainty end of thought Marlon speaking. Um, thank you for that. That's a, it's very, I think, trust is a really complex thing to talk about, but also feels really simple. And on, on some level, just like, yeah, relationship, community, and really owning when you mess up. Um, thank you so much, Yolanda and I, for, for those thoughts. Um, so, okay, some people, someone raised their hand, but just before we had a question about, um, I'm curious about how, as a two-spirit person, how can I indigenize my own creative process and recognize and include my ancestors into my work? End of um, Yolanda speaking. I mean, I think, I think that's a person, I think it's personal, right? Like, I think it's what, what you feel works for you and your body and your spirits and your um, practice uh, for like, what works for me might not work for you and what works for Aria might not work for me. And, and so like, it's, it's, I think that taking the time to listen to yourself um, and taking the time to just sit and I find that being on the land is helpful because being on land uh, quiets everything down and it allows me to open and, and really listen. Um, and I think that's where a lot of those answers are found um, is in those those sort of like those moments of reflection um, and, and or doing the things that bring you joy. Where are you most comfortable? How are you most comfortable? Um, you know, I use, like I said, I use medicines to call my ancestors in, um, and I, I, I find physical presences sometimes of them. I keep rocks around me all the time. Um, those are some ways in which I keep the land with me and, and sort of keep, keep them, you know, everything sort of um, alive and active. Um, but I, 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 I really think it's about you know, tuning into yourself and 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 asking yourself what you need. 
Um, what, what do you need when you create? What works for you? Uh, and, and, and going through those series of questions, maybe as if it's somebody else, you know? Um, I think that self-love is hard and, um, and sometimes it helps to think about, you know, yourself as like the person you love the most in the world. Uh, and, 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 and seeing your way through that. Um, I, I wish I, I wish I had an answer for you. I just, I feel like it's so personal to you. Uh, and that I think that if you, if you really spend some time listening to yourself and, and lighting that smudge and, and sitting with the medicine, sitting on the land, that you will find the, the deeply rooted indigenous practice that lives within your body. Um, because it's there. Yeah, end of thought. And I was speaking, I would offer, ask yourself, what does indigenizing mean to you? And to, to articulate it for yourself, to then be able to implement it in a way that feels authentic for you. And then to ask, like, how do you want your ancestors to engage with your work? What ways are you hoping that they are present and that you want them to hold you? And, and go from there. If you, can, if you can clearly articulate your wants and your needs, you can like, call them back into yourself. But you have to know what those two things are and what you want from those two things before um, you can start to like, yeah, integrating that into a creative process. End of thought. Merlin speaking. Um, okay, so we had a raised hand, Chantal Gagnon. Um, <laughs> please, um, I don't know where you are. I'm, I'm right here, Tansi. Hello, okay. I'm actually in Treaty 7 territory in Mokrinstis, which is in Calgary. Um, but hi, Yolanda. Hi, so Chantal. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Yolanda when she was here in Mulkinstis um, doing bug and um, just that was such an amazing experience and uh, she brought back a song that I thought was gone from my life and I was just so humbled for that so hi, hi, now I'm gonna get all teary okay <laughs> um, but I'm just gonna describe my background so I have a, a beautiful red wall uh, to the left of me, I have a red and black drum bag with beautiful Haida art on it. To the right of me, I have my traditional hand drum with a couple of, um, well, their t-shirts wrapped around foam to soundproof my room a little bit. Uh, and all of my traditional medicines are laid out to the side of me, um, as that's, that's part of my practice. Uh, I am Anishinaabe, Métis, and Cree from Muscat Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, which is in Treaty 6 territory. But um, my question for you, so I'm in <laughs> the West, which we are leaps and bounds behind you, unfortunately, when it comes to inclusionary practices, um, insofar as even physically um, inclusionary practices. So I've gone through many surgeries where I was in a wheelchair for, you know, six months at a time, and there was a lot of spaces that I could not enter uh, as an artist, which is just, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, and, uh, but, Beyond that, one of the challenges, I think, um, not only here in Mulkinstis, but pretty much everywhere across the globe, is lateral violence. So how do you navigate the lateral violence that we're experiencing on a regular basis when we're trying to build relationships with different organizations and different community organizations, when that lateral violence can be so insidious to actually break down those relationships that we've been building. There's been a few organizations that I worked really hard to build a relationship with. Um, you know, I was with that organization helping with events for five years, and then I wanted to give another artist an opportunity to bring her crew in and perform and present. And she took that opportunity to um, basically slander me and ruin my relationship with that organization. Mm -hmm. And so um, unfortunately, it's really, really difficult um, to navigate that. And, you know, you try and do it like humbly and I, I've always been really kind and I always, you know, um, everything I do is inspired by the seven teachings and making sure that I leave a good, you know, world for my seven generations. I'm a mom, I'm a single mom with four kids. Well, when you landed, <laughs> I only had two kids, uh, but I took on two kinship care kids right before the pandemic, so we got to know each other real well. <laughs> but, um, so now I'm a mother of four, but I want to maintain um, that, you know, that 
leadership role within our communities. So how do we address it in a good way? And how do we make sure that that lateral violence practice can, you know, be navigated and hopefully um, subdued? Uh, Yolanda speaking. Miigwech Chantal, it's so good to see your face um, and hear your voice. Yeah, um, I, I think the first thing I want to say is that it's important to recognize that, you know, Indigenous folks are not a monolith and that we all feel and think different things and have different opinions and, um, and not everybody works the same way. Um, you know, uh, some, I, I think that we all, and that, and that, that is sometimes what can cause that lateral violence that Chantelle is speaking about. Um, you know, is is that we all we all operate differently, and not everybody you know ha holds the same um, worldviews, and that's okay. One of the um, the <laughs> the best things I ever heard was, "All of this is true at once," you know, and I and I I think that is true. Somebody else's truths are as true as my own truths are, and so um, uh, and that uh, paradoxes and conflictions will all will always exist uh, with each other, and so. Yeah, lateral violence is, is a tricky thing, especially in our industry and especially in um, amongst Indigenous people. It's it's always a it's always a hard one. It always stings different, you know, when it's your own community hurting you. Um, I think that for me, I I try to hold the uh, the deep understanding that colonialism runs so deep and that our 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 brains are so colonized in so many ways and so for me i try not i don't think of that as an excuse i think of that as a truth right like that is a truth that we are all holding and some people are at different points with it and so for those folks that are causing that harm and causing that violence it's coming from a colonial space um and i just then you know I just feel bad that they're not at the point where they they've done that work yet. Um, and, and it's, and it, and I, I hear you when you're saying, you know, as a leader, it's hard to engage with that because it's, you know, you never know, well, you don't know when it's going to happen. And, and when it does happen, it's like, how do you hold people accountable? Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I think that we've had some good examples of holding people accountable. I think we've had some bad examples of holding people accountable um, because we are not perfect and, and it's always gonna be complicated when we're dealing with these, with these, with these things, these aspects. Um, I don't know if, I'm, I don't think I'm answering anything. I think that it's, I think, that it's um, I think for, yeah, I think remembering, and, and, and understanding and holding their truth along with our truths. Uh, and, and I think, I think that, it, that it, remembering that it's not about you, you know, it's not about, when it happens to us, it's not about us. It's something that they're going through. It's a, it's their, it's, it's a, it's a them problem, but they're making it about you. So that when they harm you and when they cause that lateral violence, they're making it about you, but it's really about them. Um, and I think that when I hold, when I remember those things and when I hold those things, it, it makes that hurt a little bit less. Um, and then, you know, uh, it's hard to remain, I feel like it, it's hard to remain diplomatic in situations when, when I, I find for me personally, there's like a lot of like, fighting going on around me. And so then it's like, how, like I have to stay whole, I have to hold my own truths uh, steady in all of that. And so I think, I think it's, I think holding your truths, holding your values, staying strong in that core, remembering who you are and where you come from and the things that you do uh, is a, an important aspect of dealing through that and moving through that as well. Knowing that, you know, you did, the best you could and you did all that all that you could coming from that core system of values uh inside um yes and what you said hurt people hurt people exactly so yeah i think i i hope that helps <laughs> end of thought i'm speaking i'll add 
a few things. It makes me think about the difference between calling out and calling in. Yeah. And how to center yourself and how to center your needs and your capacity inside of how you decide to engage with somebody who has hurt you. And it makes me think about like, um, the three different kinds of people. It's like, there's folks that as much energy as you pour into them, their minds are never going to change. They're never going to see things your way that they're like immovable. And maybe that person isn't somebody that you want to invest your energy into trying to change their mind. And then there's people that are just uninformed, but are willing to learn and willing to grow that are in the middle of it, like don't, don't necessarily stand on either side. And then there's the people that just, just need to be contacted to, to be able to like apologize or to acknowledge that hurt has happened. And it makes me think about like how, how to apologize and what we're seeking when we're asking somebody who has hurt us to engage with us inside of some kind of conflict resolution and to really know what we're going into it seeking. Do you want them to just acknowledge that they did something and that will make it better? Or is there more that you're craving to be able to move forward? And if you can like look at the overarching structure of the scenario that happened, you might be able to engage with it in a way that's going to care for you the best because you have to look after yourself first. End of thought. Merlin speaking. Thank you so much, Aria and Yolanda. Just flagging that we have about five minutes left. Um, so we might just take the last question in the chat, which is um, I am not Indigenous but Asian Canadian and on the margins and underrepresented. How does this situation look to you navigating the theater world? Is there any push for a coming out party yet? Uh, Yolanda speaking. Uh, I, I'm, I'm unsure of the question. What, can you repeat it? Wait, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, okay, so I think that, um, I think if if you're talking if you if you mean like a coming out party in terms of like being of representation in in the th the theater industry, um, I I mean, I think we're getting there. I actually do think that I've seen I I've been I think I've been able to see a change like track a change, uh, in terms of whose stories are being told, who's telling those stories, and who's on stage telling them. What I'm not seeing is leadership positions. I'm there are some, there have been some. It, we've obviously that we've seen some of those changes, but um, I think there needs to be more leadership positions uh, from people who look like like us. That that uh, that um, because. <sighs> Because we need, it's the people who are making the decisions, right? It's the people who are making the financial decisions and and the hiring decisions. Like those are the people that we need. Um, we need more, you know, um, representation in those aspects. Um, but I do think that you know there's been a shift in in that in, that, in storytelling in, in in the industry. Um, and it feels like a, a, a like a like a walk like we're we're walking there you know uh, I don't know if we're uh, you know we're, I, I don't know if we're quite ready for a coming out party yet because um, a lot of people made a lot of promises after last summer and then did not follow through with those promises um, so uh, there's been a lot of performative actions from institutions and I just like to see more actual action uh before I, I i give over to them and say yeah you did it you know like i think that there needs there still needs to be there's still a lot more work that needs yeah. to be done yeah, yeah thank but... you yeah i asked the question so. oh sorry i yeah no i, I asked the question because it's regarding um 
Uh, I'm sort of on the edges, on the fringes. Like I volunteer for the Toronto Fringe, I volunteer for SemaWorks. And you know, I, I see that people are coming from overseas, but they are more commonly overseas. You know what I'm saying? There's people from Germany, from France, from um, Italy. There, uh, about two summers ago, there was a um, group from Hong Kong, but they live in East Coast Canada. Mm. I mean, but I don't see it happening in Toronto. I mean, if, if I want, if I'm applying for a job, and like, you know, I'm on the fringes right now, so I'm not really applying it. I'm getting there. Um, it's about... Um, it's about not knowing where I can go with my statement of what I can do. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, what can I, what can I do for me? What can I do for the uh, company? What can I do for general people of Asian descent and for indigenous people? And, you know, if we're going to leadership roles, which I'm not aiming for, but, you know, it includes these uh, marginalized people, you know, Blacks included and women and all that. So, I mean, where are we exactly? Uh, here I am, an Asian Canadian, asking you this question, you know, is there a coming out party needed? Like, can we like just slide into this, this sort of situation? And, yeah. I don't know if you have those answers. You probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Yolanda speaking, or Aria, do you want to, do you have something to say? I was, this is Aria speaking. I was just going to say, like, especially because I, I exist in both the theater community and I also exist in the dance community. And I think about, like, how I've seen conversations get started and more so in the theater community than in the dance community, which is why I, like, find myself desiring to be more involved in the theater community in Tagorando specifically, but that conversations are starting and we can see that there are statements of intention. And now is when we wait to see and we push for action. Mm -hmm. And I think about like, not like how, how do we dismiss the idea of like, organizations thinking that we're entitled to something when there's like a history behind why we should be given platforms inside of these institutions. And again, I'm not really answering your question, but I really, like, I really do think it comes down to the accountability of these organizations who have said that they wanna make a change for radical inclusion and that it's now about making that happen. So folks need to get hired. People need to step down from their positions. Money needs to get redistributed. That there's, there's tangible ways that we've talked about the, this uh, coming out party, <laughs> but we need to, now is the time that we start to see those things happen. And because we haven't seen it, I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Sounds good to, to what I hear. So thank you. Yolanda speaking. I do just want to add too, like that there are um, the the institutions that are doing some really great work. Like I think about TPM and I think about Cahoots and um, like these are institutions that have programs available as well, right? So if you look into um, there are different like creation creators units or like um, newcomer experiences or like there's a, a lot of these institutions do have these um, ways of being involved with them um, that can uh, connect you to community and then uh, and then you know it's it's sort of that way into the industry in a way that's like not um, as traumatic often <laughs> as some as yeah. some other ways can be, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I would I would say you know look into some of these different um, institutions that are on the forefront of diversity and inclusion, um, and and they have a lot of programs that can be offered that can um, that are gateways into uh, community connection and platform for storytelling. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Marilyn speaking, I think we're just about out of time. Um, I really, 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 really want to thank you for holding this space, um, but also for your trust, um, your generosity, and just really being so eloquent and, and so amazing. And really, I'm miigwech, thank you, merci. I'm really, really grateful for having spent the evening 
listening to both of you. Miigwech. Amazing. Thank you all so much for your generosity and you know engaging in such poignant and meaningful conversation tonight. Yolanda and Aria, it was such a pleasure to hear you both speak. And Merlin, thank you so much for moderating and having such evocative and wonderful questions. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I just echo uh, Ku speaking. I echo everything that, that Becky said. Thank you. Thank you all, Merlin, Yolanda, Aria. I'm really, really grateful to have um, been able to be here for this conversation. Uh, thank you also to our interpreters, Carmel and Rogue, um, as well as TPM and uh, Red Dress Productions. And thank you also to the behind the scenes crew, uh, Liz, who's been um, running this Zoom uh, the whole time, uh, as well as Caridwin, who's, who's done a lot to help sort of set up the whole tech situation. Um, Rinchen at TPM, who's supported a lot with uh, panel coordination um, and countless others at, T at uh, TPM. Um, Becky? Yeah, and you know, big thanks to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, thanks to all those who offered um, some really wonderful questions. We really appreciate it. Um, and just before we wrap up, I want to mention that we have another panel tomorrow evening um, called Rebuilding Sensory Worlds. And we hope that you will join us. You can still register for tomorrow's panel if you're interested. Uh, and also just a reminder that there is a active listening breakout room uh, that will remain open for the next 30 minutes. Um, and so because of how Zoom works, we're not actually gonna like end this meeting um, because if we end it, the breakout room will end. So uh, we invite you to leave on your own accord. We won't kick anyone out. Um, and I think Liz has also posted a survey into the chat um, a little while ago. Maybe Liz can post it again. Um, and I think it'll be sent out to everyone who registered via email. Um, so if you have uh, a couple minutes to fill out the survey, that'd be awesome. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Miigwech. Bye, my pee. Have a good night. Laliak, folks. Good night.